I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous video I did with this MacBook Air, but I did do the modification that, have, that has been in some YouTube videos that involve using a one and a half millimeter thermal pad, this one being from Thermal, thermal Right, and this material, which is a, a three millimeter pad. We'll get to this one in a second. To do that thermal modification to hack the MacBook Air's thermal system and basically make it perform like an M1 based MacBook Pro. I went back and forth as I was going to qualify that and go through a whole bunch of explanation in that video, but really when it came down to it, as far as the performance and the efficiency, it didn't matter because if you had a MacBook Pro M1 and put it in low power mode, it's gonna be basically the same thing. That was why I left it like it was, but there was a little bit of, little um, asterisk there that there was a thermal modification made and that one followed YouTube videos that came out, I think last year or early, yeah, early 2021, somewhere in that vicinity. And I wasn't gonna make this video like most videos because why am I gonna make a video about something that's already happened? But an interesting thing happened while I was using this. Uh, I've had the thermal mod for maybe two months and was doing moderate levels of work with the MacBook Air. And then I had some workloads that were quite intense. I was doing a lot of transcoding work. I could have offloaded that to the M1 based Mac mini, but that functions as a server. So I don't really touch it or really give it anything that is outside of my regular workflow. So I just let the MacBook Air handle it, which it, it's fine. It's fine with it. But the strange thing I found was that it was in the process of charging and it stopped charging. Both the Mac OS indications, iStat menus, all indicated that it had stopped charging. And I checked the battery temperature and I ended up using coconut battery to get a representation of what the battery temperature was. Although it's, I think it's a combined location and there are, uh, as you might expect, numerous temperature sensors that are involved with measuring the temperature of the three cells. Probably gonna demonstrate it incorrectly here. And that, that was concerning to me because the MacBook Air stopped charging and I'd never experienced it stop charging before I made the thermal modification. So I got out the thermal imaging camera and I started setting things up, getting it prepared the best way that I could to capture what was going on as far as temperatures in the chassis and therefore around the batteries when this thing is, is working at 100% CPU or I guess 800% CPU, which is all cores going full blast. The first thing I started with was the, I used the configuration like in the YouTube videos, obviously that was the one, one already configured. I already had it set up. And I ran this at an ambient temperature of, uh, just the room ambient of 69.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And the relative humidity was 42.7. And what I did is I just ran it for 20 minutes. So started it, looked at what the power consumption was for the system on chip just after starting. So just past T equals zero. Looked at the performance cores and the efficiency cores to see what frequencies they were operating at and what the total power was. And then I came back at 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And then once it's, it's stabilized, which was basically um, the maximum was 20 minutes. I stopped transcoding a video and handbrake using only the CPU like I did in the previous video. It was a very, very good test. And then I tried to charge the laptop. I stopped handbrake and I immediately started to try to charge it. And I would check to see whether or not I could charge the laptop. And there are three total configurations. We're gonna do the YouTube one first. I'm just calling it the YouTube one because it's the one I found on YouTube. Configuration two is gonna be the base, the stock configuration, which uses this little foam piece, both, both an insulator, but it very slowly allows the heat to transfer to the back of the chassis, which this is actually stuck on the back of the, of the chassis. I think it's on this side actually. And then the third configuration was the one that I thought would be the, the best of, of both worlds. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that one uh, in a bit. Here you'll see that at about 10 minutes in the, in the first configuration in the YouTube videos, the YouTube video configuration, 
configuration one, that we're still at 17 watts. And at about 20 minutes, we're at 16.1 watts. So we actually saturated the thermal solution and the system on trip is starting to regulate down a little bit, which is to 2.89 gigahertz with the efficiency cores running at their 2.064 gigahertz. They never really changed. At, like I said, 23 minutes, I stopped handbrake. And then at 25 minutes, two minutes later, I tried to charge immediately. It would not charge. It would not charge for many minutes. Once everything cooled down after about five minutes, it resumed charging again. So that was configuration one. And you can see in the thermal imaging video that really what's happening here is that it seems like the one and a half millimeter thermal pad is, is really doing all the heavy lifting here. It is actually short, shorting out the whole thermal solution and just the system on chip is radiating out to the back of the chassis. And that is the, that is the thermal solution. So this material really isn't doing much at all. That's sitting on the far, I think it's the right hand side or I'm gonna get it wrong every single time, but I think it's on this side. That is being used to act as a heat sink to allow for the heat to go somewhere and then be slowly released into the chassis passively since there's no fan in the MacBook Air. The second configuration is just stock. I took all the pads off, took them all off, and ran it again. So this time, no surprise, we hit 17 watts right out of the gate, and then we come down pretty quickly to about 11 to 12 watts, uh, both at 10 minutes and 20 minutes, with the performance cores at 2.5 gigahertz, efficiency cores at 2.064, and at about 25 minutes, it had fallen on a little bit lower to about 10 watts. So I came back at about 25 minutes, and it had settled down to around 10 watts with a performance core clock speed of about 2.434 gigahertz. And then I plugged it in to see if it would charge. And of course, it immediately started charging with no issues whatsoever. So I thought, okay, cool. At least I can demonstrate that the stock configuration, that it should be able to charge the battery like I had experienced before, but never really tested before. I just, it was just, I didn't think about it. I just plugged it in and it always charged. So the third configuration I thought it was a, a stroke of brilliance. Instead of using, <laughs> I'm setting this up already, but I thought I had a stroke of brilliance, which is instead of using this material, which is not particularly, doesn't have a very high thermal conductivity, I would just get the three millimeter Extreme Odyssey thermal pad, which does have a 12.8 watt per millikelvin thermal conductivity. So same as the 1.5, at least the way they spec it out, same as the 1.5 millimeter. But my intention was, don't short circuit the cooling solution. Remove the material that is around the system on chip and the heat pipe or the transfer medium and just put a thermal pad around the heat sink. So that way, heat is shuttled off from the system on chip. The, the chassis still remains pretty cool. It's still gonna get, still gonna get warmer than it would just by, uh, from a stock configuration but it will do two things. One, it helps keep the batteries a bit cooler. There's not so much heat being generated into the chassis that's then radiating up into the batteries. And secondly, it's, it allows the, the stock thermal solution to work as it was intended. You're just bonding this heat sink to the chassis. And I thought it would work really well. And it turns out <laughs> the results were, it depends, it depends and I'll explain. Just past starting the handbrake transcoding, 17 watts per usual. At the 10 and 20 minute mark, we're a little higher than we were with the stock configuration. 11.3 watts and 10.8 watts, pretty much the same. But what I did notice is that about at 25 minutes when I came back, it was still at just under 11 watts. So about a 10% improvement in thermal output and bonus, after that 25 minute run, I immediately plugged it into charge and it charged right away. There was no cutting out or anything like that. So it's definitely keeping the batteries cooler. And you can see in the thermal imaging 
that the hot spot moves to where the the heat sink is and where it's being thermally conducted to the the chassis but it doesn't create such a hot zone around where the batteries are which is great conclusions the fact that it stopped charging and this, the basically the premise of this video concern me a bit i don't think it will actually i don't think using the original configuration the 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 one that was uh, that some youtubers had had shown will damage the batteries it may shorten their life a bit but i don't think it will damage them because the system will stop it will just not allow the system to charge as if it was in a high ambient temperature situation but my preference the configuration that i'm sticking with is the third configuration which just uses the three millimeter pad over the heatsink bonded to the chassis that one i found in mixed conditions so when you're using both the cpu and gpu together it does sustain higher power output and i've got a couple of screenshots here where it'll hover around 13 to 14 to even 15 watts for minutes at a time and will finish a render or do whatever it needs to do and run that for a much longer period of time than stock. Stock pretty much hopped up to about 11 to 12 watts and it would then fall back down again to around 10 to 11 watts if it was a longer run. I didn't buy this to be the MacBook Pro. Like I bought this and not a MacBook Pro. Without having a fan in it, I, I, there was an expectation that there would be a slight decrease in performance because over a longer duration, because there is no fan in it and it's passively cooled. And in all the work that I've done, and I think I mentioned this in the previous video, I've never experienced a situation where there wasn't enough performance for what I needed. I would put forth two things. One, based on my testing with the thermal imaging camera and looking at what was going on with the batteries, they are getting warmer than what some of the previous videos have shown. And I think that's due in part to the fact that they didn't properly configure the camera to measure temperature on a surface such as an anodized aluminum enclosure. Everything you're seeing, thermal imaging camera is properly configured for the right emissivity for a thermal imaging camera so that you're getting the right temperatures or you're getting as close to the right temperatures as possible. The second thing is there's a slight increase if you're in high elevated ambient temperature and you're running this thing very intensely that the, that the system is not gonna know that you've stuck a whole bunch of thermal pads on it and are artificially increasing the internal ambient temperature of the entire system. And that could lead to componentry that's inside on the printed circuit board that is rated for a certain ambient temperature range to be pushed more toward its upper limit and thereby limit the overall lifespan of the, the laptop. So something to consider. I just Basically, I wanted to show you what I discovered. Doesn't mean if you've made this modification, immediately go and remove it and just be aware of what the modification and what it, can, what it means for the batteries and how the battery charging performs. And that might have an impact on the battery's overall performance and longevity. And also it may have a impact on the overall lifetime and the performance of the longevity of the componentry, the passive componentry, especially the passive componentry that is supporting all of the systems on the MacBook Air. It's kind of cool to see this. I wouldn't say that the, the third configuration is better. I'm more comfortable with it, and it keeps the overall temperatures more stable on the chassis, which with the unit sitting like this, it's radiating up. So you're getting less heat radiating up into the batteries, which is good for everything. And then also radiating up into the componentry surrounding the system on chip like I mentioned before. If you're only periodically stressing the, the, the system, it's probably fine, but I do regularly stress this thing because I'm doing a bunch of video editing and other things that, a variety of things that I mentioned before in the previous video that do probably on a, on a daily basis to every other day basis stress this thing for about an hour or two at a time. So it was my aim to find something that was kind of the in-between even though I really didn't need it, I could remove this and still get, and I'd be fine with it, but I kind of wanted to because I bought the thermal pads and wanted to play with them. And once I put this in here, temperatures all look fine. I'm like, I'm not opening it up a third time to take it apart again, just to remove that out of there. So hope that helps shine a little light for those that maybe have MacBook Airs that are now looking at the newer 
M1 variants that have come out, the Pro, the Max, and of course the Ultra, and are wondering if they could squeeze a little more performance out of there. And the answer is you can, it's just be cognizant of what you're doing. I would say one last tip is to really keep uh, a gap between the material. There's like a little metal feature that sticks up out of the chassis. And then there's the tops of the batteries. And just make sure that you're not getting this thing too close to that metal feature or it's laying on top of it. I mean, if you try to go over it, we won't be able to close the thing. Try to keep an air gap there so that you're not directly heating up that part. You don't want to be heating up parts on the top part of the chassis, if, if at all possible, because that is touching up with things that are not meant to be heat sinking uh, just like the, the bottom of this chassis, it is meant to be heat sinking, but only to a certain extent. So you don't want to be heating up parts that aren't meant to be heat stressed. So hopefully that's all helpful. Yeah, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.